Yeah, I'm trying to. One. A man, your husband. And that's one lucky kid you got. <laughs> I told Josh it would be wrong to use the kid. But he said no one would get hurt. Shh, don't talk. Just try to get some rest till the paramedics get here. Sure. So you're going to be all right? Oh, I'm glad. If it weren't for you, they would have killed me. Couldn't let him. I know she'll love that. <laughs> Kids, your grandma always wanted. you leave any time you want. I won't keep you one second longer than you want to stay with me. This may be our last chance. Jenny, I love you. I need you. Can't lose you again. Come with me. So that was fun. Ryan, who was it? Is Ryan here with us or not? 
I haven't logged them in. Uh, oh, if you wanna... got to have the rye here. So that clip was sent to Ryan by a fan of that show, and that show was called Capital, and it was on CBS, and that was 1987. I'd say that was a few semesters back. And um, it was so fun for me to see that, and I have really no recollection of that scene because it was so long ago, even though I have a crazy good memory. But I can tell you a little piece of trivia if the person that submitted that clip is here. Okay, so that trivia is this. Do you remember a movie called Midnight Express? I think everybody remembers this movie because it was so intense and it was the true story of a man named Billy Hayes who was uh, arrested uh, smuggling, uh, he had drugs in his luggage and he got caught and he went into a Turkish prison for several years, broke out. If you haven't seen the movie, you have to, you have to see it. It's so good even to today, it holds up so beautifully. Um, but anyway, so the reason I brought that up is because the real Billy Hayes, who the movie was actually about, um, was my kidnapper on, on these particular es episodes. So I got to work with the real Billy Hayes and, uh, and we have remained in touch throughout all the years and he lives here in Las Vegas now. And he has a one man show called uh, Riding the Midnight Express that is so good. And so anyway, that was really kind of a little piece of trivia I wanted to give maybe the person who submitted that because I really, like I said, I didn't keep things. So when I get something that's in that good a shape, it just makes me feel really good because it was such an important part of my life and in the 80s and that show was uh, one of my favorite shows I have ever worked on. Um, it was just a magical time uh, back then. And uh, then we were replaced by the Bold and Beautiful in, I, I can't remember, but I think it was like, if that was 87, so it was probably 91 or something like that. And uh, then I, I went to, I moved to Italy for two years to figure myself out. And, um, and so that really makes me have a wonderfully fun memory. How are you all today? I'm excited. Do we have Ryan? I'm oh. here. Oh, hello there. Where are you? I hear you. You're like the voice of God. There you are. There, there you are. I am. Hi, look at that great face. clip. Wasn't that a great clip? Oh, it was really a great clip, you know, and I'm trying to think of how old I was there. I was such a baby there. I, I don't even know. 1987. It aired in 87. So do the math. So we do the math. I'm 66. Math is in my thing. Okay, I'm 29. 66 now. Still 29. <laughs> was I 29 mm -hmm. then? Still 29. Really, was I 29? Always 29. No, that's what it is, 29. I, I was 29 years old there. <laughs> God, I can't believe, no, I, I couldn't have, was I really 29? I'm still 29, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, all right, let's see who's here, Brian. Michelle Scanlon, hello, John Eric St. James, hello, John Eric, Heather Tanchuk. The Bold and the Beautiful started at, she says, in 1989. So two years after that, our wonderful show got canceled and they put on The Bold and the Beautiful, which is also a really wonderful show. I love that show and I love everybody on it. It's just a, such a, it's a family show. And if you ever work for the Bells, you realize how very different the experience of working is because they just have a, they just have it down, you know, and they, and they really are like a family, their shows. So I am going to say, gosh, you know, can you imagine that show has been on ever since, Ryan? The Bold and the Beautiful, I, it's, it's like 40 years old now. Isn't that crazy? Uh, General Hospital, I think, is at 60. Yeah, but General Hospital has been around since I was a kid. You know what I mean? So mm, mm -hmm. that, it, it's just hard to believe. Kathy Hobbs, Tracy Valine, Elizabeth Gandy, Ron Hibbs. Uh, Elizabeth Gandy wants to know if Jordan has left. Jordan has not left the building. In fact, he is in this room with us right now watching, waving at everybody. And he's, uh, I'm leaving Tuesday, and I think you're leaving around the same time, or more or less. Tomorrow. Oh, you're leaving tomorrow? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. 
I'm going to miss you. It's been nice having you for a week. It's been a blast. It's been so fun. Hello, Patricia Duff, Geraldine Coviello. <laughs> she says, you don't look 66. God bless you. You know what, Geraldine? I happen to believe, and I haven't had any work done on my face or anything like that, but I will say this. I think uh, aging is largely in your mind, and I think uh, you age according to how you look at aging. And um, it, it depends on your joy level, too, in life, because you wear your face, your, your life on your face. I like to say you wear your life on your face. And so if you, you know, have a good attitude and you don't fear aging, which I don't, um, and you have a, a joy in your life, you're going to age really well because that is just the way it works. Remember how much the mind is in charge. And aging is a huge, huge fear for a lot of people. Hello, Catherine Maxey. Hello, Helen Barrett. Rochelle Ness. Well, hello, there's a new name for me, Deb Tyler. Oh, you, you were an ABC watcher. Yep, me too. I watched them all. I watched Days of Our Lives when I was growing up. And I remember when I was a little kid, and I, I can't even remember all the characters on that show. And I remember thinking when I was really little, gosh, you know, I, I could do that. I want to grow up and do that someday. And that's where it all started. It is exactly where it all started. So I am certain I manifested it because it was in my mind that I was, I didn't want to be a movie star. I didn't want to be a television star at night. I wanted to be a soap opera star. Why? because I could be home and make a living at the same time and have what we would call a normal life. Little did you know. Little did I know my life would be anything but normal. <laughs> but still, it was really my goal, you know, is to act as much as possible, to be home, to have somewhat of a normal life. So Days of Our Lives was my, was my show I watched when I was growing up. And then I started watching, um, and that actually was my first job. I, w I, ha I had a an extra role on Days of Our Lives, and one of the characters sang on the show, and he sang to me in a restaurant, and so I had lots of close-ups, which made my mom and dad really happy. And then I, I watched um, One Life to Live. I watched um, All My Children. Yeah, it was really, you know, it's funny how you, you conjure things to yourself. Remember, re be careful what you think. M meaning, you know, be in mi mindful of your thoughts because uh, I am pretty certain that I made all that come to me. Now, what if I had been thinking something like negative, right? So I'm glad I didn't. Anyway, welcome to the show, everybody. We have Todd Fisher. How about some applause for Todd Fisher? There you go. Yeah, I should. Woo! I should. <laughs> <laughs> one one man. What it's just what what well we have applause too. We, there, there it is. is. is a, a delayed applause. For you, honey. That's all for you. And Aspen. Aspen is there. here today doing camera, so we're really you know, we're good. We're we're happening. You know who hasn't been here in a long time? It's John. Well, he comes over during the week. He just hasn't been here for the show. No, I know. I know. Since and, and he's been traveling a lot and stuff, but I miss him being in here with us too. Well, you need to put out your request early yes. to get him in. Yes. So what is going on? What are we doing today? Are we going to have some show and tell? or what's? Well, we have a little show and tell. We have some film clips um, from uh, my childhood that are relatively amusing, early filmmaking attempts at 12. You know, yesterday you showed Jordan and I um, something that was so... Um, it, it was good for my heart. It, it was your mom and Donald O'Connor. You had never seen it either. It was a, someone that was in her band, the drummer, you say? Yeah, I I'm not sure if that footage is actually here. Um, well, Ryan, wait till you see I didn't, this if he um, has it because it is so... I didn't plan on running that. It's them backstage fooling bring around. That up, it's um, so cool. I'm not sure it's on this account is the problem. Yeah. Well, you oh, actually, I get a lot of accounts on here, so it might be. Oh, I hope so, because that... that what it, happened, basically... Your mom was so happy in that, that it made me happy to see her like that. David Dansky um, was my mother, one of my mother's sound people, and he contacted me, said he had found some old home movies, uh, and did I want them, and so he, he sent them to me. So let me... I could probably find those and play them. Let's see. Uh, let's see. D... Should be able to do a little search here. It wasn't on that email account. Just have to look at them all. It's worth it because, you know, like I said, seeing your mom in in that state, 
in that, of that state of happiness was so, I, I've never seen her like that uh, because by the time I came along here, she, you know, was worn out from it all. You know what I mean? She had really been through well, a lot. And so uh, I, when I saw her playful like that and full of energy and happy with her friend Donald O'Connor, it just, just really um, affected me in a really wonderful way, I guess. Well, let's see here. Uh, I'm trying to remember how I did that. Okay, so I was able to... I need to fast forward it because <coughs> it's too long. Right. So we'll go to Apple TV. She's already there. Unbelievable. Okay, no, good Aspen. Okay so, okay, so here's the footage we're talking about. So this is uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania you're looking at. And they were on they That's were on Donald tour, O'Connor. Uh, doing concerts. So, right? yeah, so th this is Kelly, who was the hairdresser. Not sure that is. We'll have to see in a minute. Donald mm -hmm. O'Connor here, my mom there, and it's uh, just very impromptu. Vapors, mom, get the vapors. Mom, get, get the vapors. Get out of here. I'll miss my camera. Get out of here. Get out of my lap. Get out of here. 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 Get out too hot? Too hot. Give them cold. Give them cold. Okay, now we'll talk about something else. Now we'll talk about the street guys. May the hotel or something. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. No, no, you can't throw me away from you. No, you can't throw me away. I'm not Jew. That's me. He's not Jewish. He said this fellow here is a Gentile. Bob it's a tap dancing. Bob can't be on the day go by without a prayer or two. You see, you're almost all dry. Never. Never like the this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not dry at all, Debbie. No. <laughs> what happened? What happened? Ow, your phone. Get oh, out of here. Oh, oh, oh. 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 On the plane. <laughs> Get that. Okay. How so, cute. Do you see how happy she is? Well, it's, uh, it's, this was, uh, we had a date on this. What was that? It date? was before the hotel days here. Yeah, I, no, no. I ha actually have the date. Uh, it was 80 something. Yeah. Uh, it was way and before the hotel. The days. 80s were such a great time. 89. Such September a great time. September of 89. Yeah. She's in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, the whole cast there. So this would have been. Uh, you know, Albie, the drummer, and Joey, and, you know, the gang, you know, prior to, this is really nine years before the hotel. We were doing around this time uh, some tours with Donald and Debbie. It was kind of a Donald and Debbie tour. Oh, they, I bet people I have a, a really well shot show up in Reno. So it was Debbie and Donald do Reno. Yeah, wouldn't so. it be great if we could play? Th I, there's a fly in here again. Well, you can get away with some of that stuff because of the way the arrangements are. There are arrangements, and we paid to shoot it. Yeah. So I have the rights to actually broadcast yeah, that. But, but you tell that to them. You know, there's just you I just got don't kicked, run the you know, whole thing. Is my YouTube channel point. got kicked off for two years, and I just got that back and dusting it off and doing something with it. But it's it's so iffy. Yeah, but wouldn't it be cool? You know what we should just do? We should make a DVD of stuff like that that well i i have because people tw I have would 20 love that. shows but the behind the scenes stuff is fun too uh so when we were doing the donald and debbie and reno thing we shot some behind the scenes stuff so that's there's there's a lot of stuff that goes with it that's it's pretty pretty funny and well done that was the 80s of course though the 80s were a great time it was a great time for television i'd like everybody out there to put in the comment box what did you watch in the 80s on tv what series were you watching? I remember in the 80s, Thursday night was the NBC lineup, and we had, oh my gosh, this fly is so bold. You're under assault. I'm under assault. Hold on a second. Oh, God, I almost got him right there. He was right on my... You know, I have that thing in the other room. You do? You have the electric fly swatter? I do. I think you better bring it in here. I need to get... I, every time I get one and it goes... Introducing the world's newest, silliest, and hamburger-eatingest clown, Ronald McDonald. Now, where is that clown? Oh, Ronald. 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 Hey, Ronald. 
Here I am, kid. Hey, isn't watching TV fun? Especially when you got delicious McDonald's hamburgers. Ronald, you can't be on TV and watch it at the same time. Now, come on and meet the boys and girls. Oh, we've already met. I know we're going to be friends, too, because I like to do everything boys and girls like to do. Especially when it comes to eating those delicious McDonald's hamburgers. A magic tray here keeps me well supplied. McDonald's hamburgers, french fries, and milkshakes. Watch for me on TV. We'll have lots of fun. He's Ronald McDonald, the hamburger. So, can you imagine, this was, this was, you know, that was a commercial, a legit commercial. I know. And, uh, but I was, I was looking at some of them, like, here's another one, run, run this one up, just for a few seconds. These are softer, gentler times. The kids take the, six, the 64 Chrysler to McDonald's. Oh, and they took the order. Oh my gosh, it's before drive <laughs> I think the whistling is from Andy Griffith, okay. <laughs> the same guy. <laughs> I, I am loving these commercials, and it really is. Hey, Janie, you made it today. Yay! Um, she watched Dallas, Knott's Landing, One Life to Live, and L.A. Law. I loved it. Ryan watched Mr. Belvedere, Alf, and Dallas. Uh, let's see what other people... Now, here's a working. black and white McDonald's commercial. The key to good work habits and is essential to the team spirit that makes McDonald's hum. You probably know some special young men like these in your neighborhood. We'd like to know them, too. McDonald's is their kind of place. Yeah, okay, please. And without them, there'd be no McDonald's. There you go. So, uh, it's, uh, man, there's like a history. Imagine how many commercials that uh, McDonald's has done over the years. Yeah, but you, can you see and even feel how different the world was then? And, you know, it, and it really was a gentle time, wasn't it? I mean, there was stuff going on, but so many great things happened. And it was just, I remember, <laughs> I remember when rap music came out. It was in the, in the early 80s and it, when it was, came out. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, this is. You want to see my this version? Is, of this is really bad. I'm glad this isn't going to last very long. And now, look, we're still, it's so major. So, you know, it goes to show you that you, well, I know, just while you, you guys, don't like it doesn't mean no, anything. No, but while you guys and were. And I have an appreciation for the art. While you, know? you guys were watching those commercials, I decided to make my own McDonald's commercial. You did? You know, saw that black and white one? Yeah. All right, so cut to this. Here we go. This is my version of the McDonald's commercial. See, there's the McDonald's. Now, this is on my train set. Uh, we're shooting this in black and white. To in oh, I'm sorry, McDonald's just spontaneously burst into oh. flames. What kind of, yeah, grease that's right. It was, they didn't clean the grease trap, and apparently the whole thing just blew up in flames. So, um, now, we were trying to figure out special effects at this time. So, this is a camera test, uh, and we were trying to figure out how to burn McDonald's down, obviously. Now, by today's standards, we could get reported for this, uh, I suspect. But back then, we were trying to make this part of our little movie. So the car, and it's, it's actually on my train set. You see the tracks in the foreground. You, you caught the McDonald's on fire. You lit it on fire. But you don't see it burning to the ground? I see it, but... but Look at me. Aww. So, yes, yeah, so that's what we were doing. But what, what, it, would, what it was for was we were, built, we were working on this film. And uh, th this is the film. It, it, it's uh, a silent film because we didn't have any sound equipment. <laughs> but uh, it was so they can play it on Turner Classic Movies on Sunday nights. Silent it, Sundays. Silent. This is definitely a silent Sunday. But okay. I think you'll get the point. So you know, don't forget we're only like twelve, right? So you know, keep keep all of that in mind okay, here. Okay. Now, what am I looking at there? You're looking at a saber liner in Palm Springs. It's a private jet in Palm Springs, parked on the runway, and. Um, this is the Palm Springs International Airport, and there's John Courtney and I coming out of the airplane, or faking it, because obviously you never actually, we just stood over there and then walked. But did you get, do you really, uh, do you understand that you are on the tarmac? Oh yeah, well in these you days, no, the, no, no, look, we're getting out of the plane now, look, we're actually getting you, out of the you plane. Would never be able to do that not since see that was multiple takes of this we obviously aren't getting it very <laughs> it's like 25 years we haven't been able to do such things all right so now this is the cut so after you get out of the airplane now we're coming down the terminal we've got our bags we're we've arrived in palm springs so this is uh, that's our first live cut 
you can see we have our equipment with us. And um, now John Courtney is uh, kind of an executive over at CNN. And uh, he and I got together recently and laughed very loud about all of this craziness. All right, so now we're ready for a cut. We're going somewhere else. Who knows where we're going now? You okay. should send In the terminal, here's the next cut. Uh, so now you've, we've cut to the interior of the, of the Palm Springs terminal. And uh, I think we're going to our limousine. Yes, there's our limousine waiting out front. So we're going to head to the limousine. Look at that budget rental car thing. Palm Spring Municipal Airport. There's the cutaway to establish. It should have actually been first to establish where we are. But, you know, we weren't really up in the editing thing. Look how cool Palm Springs looks back in the, er, in the 60s. Uh, this is early 70s. Early 70s? I'm going to call this 1970. I wonder how different it looks now from that sh angle. If it's oh, I, you can't even probably stand there. You probably could get in trouble for even being there. Oh, there's our driver who's picking us up. So he's in the Continental. That was Ed Bell. I tell stories about Ed Bell in my book. He's the one that took me first time to the racetrack to bet on exactas. And then we all got in a lot of trouble because Ed <laughs> took me gambling, <laughs> which my mother wasn't a big fan of at this Did point. Did you at least confess that you were the guilty party to talk him into such shenanigans? Never. Why would I do such things? So anyway, that he wouldn't lose his job. Uh, well, I saved his job for another reason, though. I had really nothing to do with that. Um, <laughs> you know, but, you, you know, you had to beg for forgiveness. So these were little sequences. Like, here's another one that's kind of funny that's in the same, around the same time frame. Uh, once again, in black and white. I just was influenced, obviously, black and white. Now, this is a different co-star. This is Major Brunk. This is Greenway Drive in Whittier. So we're walking up Greenway. That's Whittier in the background. And just to the left is where the Bugsy Siegel house is, where he was shot through the window. There's the rolls. That was my mother's car. Uh, and you can see that us kids have the rolls out as a studio prop. Have uh, you talked we're, to... We're not even old enough to drive. Have you talked to Major Brunk in, like... Look at the plates, by the way. Since o you were kids? Carl. But driving the rolls around seemed to be the thing to do at the time. Oh, sprinklers are on out front. That's Greenway. Uh, and then here's some footage. Oh, we're in the backyard at Greenway. So this is over by the treehouse. I had a treehouse right there. I tell that story, too. There's the Monterey Pine that's in the tree. And uh, we're going up into the treehouse. Uh, I'm, again, I don't know what the plot is here. There, we weren't so plot driven <laughs> as uh, anything else, but it's kind of fun to see these flashbacks and to see, you know, where we came. Uh, and also, again, it's, I, I, we kind of longed for uh, take two, by the way. Oh, no. Now the three of us. So now you got the three musketeers here. So now John Courtney's in on it. And he is. This is before. This is when we got the idea to do these uh, shows, so to speak for the tour buses. We realized that, that when we were filming these things and actually a tour bus came up on us filming one time and then we started actually filming the tour bus. Now there's those candlesticks, by the way, Kat. There's the Greenway house. Uh, yes. That's the dining room in the Greenway house uh, looking through into the music room. And you can see uh, there's Connie Freiberg uh, serving <laughs> food to, uh, and Bruce Gold at the end. So there's four of us at this point. Uh, and we're in the, you know what's, it's kind of interesting to see the moment, though. Connie was obviously maybe maybe at 20 years old. Uh, and you were how old here? I'm like 12. That means that I was uh, 14. I was always older. You're than older you. than me? <laughs> I'm your cougar, I, baby. I, I am. <laughs> oh, and look, we've got the expensive glasses out. Now yeah. we're, we're going go to go to... We're, we're having, that was part one of the meeting. We're having some kind of a meeting and a meal. Now we're going to have to go have the... The business meeting. Okay, and so who's that with? That's John Courtney right there. Well, we're heading up to a business meeting. A lot of intercutting here. We play the whole thing as a master. Uh-oh, I'm flipping off the camera. Okay, now okay, now here, oh, oh frame, frame slide. So we're working on a, a plan. Now, this is actually in Carrie's Playhouse, this scene. Uh, so we've set this up uh, as a, like a cabin. You see there's a poster on the wall. Now Carlos that Luvano wants to know where Carrie is. In, in these movies, we have movies with Carrie. She wasn't always in these. There's some pretty, that's actually fr Crystal, Baccarat Crystal booze. From, we've, we've commandeered from the, uh, from the bar. Now we're tasting it. And of course, it's got to be horrific. Uh, you see that Tiffany lamp in the background. I do have that. Uh, no, no idea where the rest of that stuff is. You know, you, you do have a little Tom Cruise 
action. Now, this is the front driveway here, at Greenway. I think. Did anyone ever tell you that? No, only you. Really? Now, look, look, look at this car. <laughs> There's the Datsun. Now we've commandeered this car. It's got a bashed in front end. Now, John, and who else have we got here? So now we're in uniform, you notice. These guys have British officers' uniforms on, uh, and they're questioning us in the driveway. I mean, I don't know if you find this amusing or not. You find this amusing? I like it. He likes it. Well, I use Jordan as my barometer of boredom. I love the Greenway story, so these are great. Well, that's the front driveway at Greenway, which you can no longer really look through and into. Now, you're about to see the front door at Greenway. So there's the front entrance to Greenway. And the, see those, plant, those pots right there, those bronze planters that we're passing right now? Those are here in Vegas. Yeah. See those, Kat? All right. There they are. Oh, and they're in the, aren't they by the pool right yeah, now? Yeah, right by the pool. Yeah. Now, this is the master bedroom in Greenway. So I'm not sure why we're using that, but we're using the master bedroom. And who's letting them in there? That's Major Brunk right there. Yeah. Mike Miner. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, there I am in, the, in Harry's side of the okay, bed. Okay, so. That's so Harry's side of the bed. It's the blowjob side of the bed. And you notice the water dispenser did you, there. Did he just say that? Ah, uh, uh, look, there's the camera. Now, that's where the camera was underneath the doll when I filmed Harry, and that's the angle that it saw right there when Harry was getting the blowjob. Oh, my God. That was it. And there's my mom's desk oh. that's in her room, which you've seen, and the lamp, all that sitting in the other room right now. I'm sorry. I've got the vapors, and I need a glass of something. Have I upset you that much? Mm -hmm. And there's, there, was the, uh, there was our logo that we created, uh, Fish, Fish House, House Theaters. Theaters. Presents. Yeah. Now, see, now, the way this was done in those days is you actually had a piece of glass, and you actually stuck those... Uh, letters there. I'm surprised we spelled it correctly. And then you had to put something behind it. And so that's how titles were generated in, in the primitive realm of uh, eight millimeter filmmaking when you're 12 years old. So anyway, that was uh, just something to uh, minorly amuse you. Oh, and a fade out. Oh, wow. That was big. That would have been, had to have been an iris fade because, oh, coming soon. So we have a, another attraction that we're planning to bring <laughs> bring to bear. So w these aren't as good as cat soap operas, but uh, I think we made them a couple of years <laughs> earlier. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you get? I'm looking. Sharon Amorosa just, <laughs> just making me laugh. Because I mentioned the yeah, BJ? Yeah, but, but that's what she said. She just put BJ in her. <laughs> so it's, it's a little easier for me to Well, if I say that, the then other. there are certain people that aren't going to know the, the whole BJ comment. Right. But yikes. <laughs> It, it, yeah, well, it, it, it is actually everything that I just showed you is in the book, yeah. right? Every story, more or less, right there, or in its in its parts, uh, is in the book. And here's something kind of amusing that goes with it: the train set when we were burning that uh, in the earlier footage. You know what? Let me move all no, these. No, I got it. Right you here. got I'll just it? Hold it. Okay. This is I the old. This is the old here. Lionel mm -hmm. train set controller where you control the power for the speed of the train. This was really the Cadillac of, of train set controllers for its day. Maybe some of you guys had this. Uh, this was the thing to have. So this was, that, this was the artifact that kind of went with the train set when we're burning the McDonald's down. So that, uh, that kind of goes with the story a little bit. Did you want to put that up here so people could see it a little better? Well, I don't know. Let's see if we can... You can use, you want to try to use camera one and zoom in on it? You can if you want. Is camera one uh, hooked up to the right place camera one is hooked up so she can zoom in on it okay um seth says i love that debbie kept the same lamps and bedroom furniture through the years well you notice that the lamps are next to her bed those are the alabaster lamps right uh upstairs there was earlier footage when i was in the den you saw those lamps that are now upstairs her desk is was in the bedroom was there the headboard all that stuff it still exists, I mean, because well, of... Well, Seth, when you were here, you, in Debbie's room, in her bedroom, um, you saw, when you go into, and you enter the li little living room that, that's there, those couches that she has in there well, I can from actually, the Greenway house, So right? I can show you... That's a long time ago. And, and it's, it's just incredible, because well, I Well, these candlesticks the right here... Those candlesticks right Let there. Let me take a look. Cut to uh, the movie. All right. Aspen, there you go. There you go. These candlesticks. We still have them. Those are on the table as we speak. Yeah. Uh, and as you move forward, uh, that piano, by the way, is over in storage at the warehouse. I mean, at, at the uh, ranch. 
uh, moving out of this scene into this, the Tiffany lamp is at the ranch. Uh, then this interior stuff. Now that break front is in my mom's bedroom right now. See this one right here? And so is that picture of Rudy. That's uh, actually there. But that break front is against the wall in my mom's bedroom. That little thing. And then we cut, we cut to here. These end tables are in storage. I have them. But we're using these lamps actually right now in her bed. Uh -huh. And then when you notice the table... That is in the room right now. That's in the corner of her living yep, room. Yep, yep, I, I know it. And then when you go to the, here, this is the desk. That's her desk that she had forever, so that's yes. her desk. And then right here is the water dispenser, thermos thing for next to the bed. That's also in there. Wow. Uh, so I've, I've done my best to keep the stuff uh, in play, so, shall we say. Okay, you can clear back this. So that, but go, can you go to camera one and try to zoom in on the controller? That's kind of a fun, there you go. Look, see, Amy there's... Perkins says, it's time for me to finish reading that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amy, if you get to that part, it's quite something. Yeah, so this was for controlling the speed of the train. You could have two trains, control them separately, the speed of two different trains, and this would fire off the whistle or the smoke. And Heather Tanchuk says, hey, Todd, Bloom's birthday, Blum's birthday cakes when we were kids and BJ's laughing face. You're hilarious. That is true. So that was, my mother was big. Uh, I have a lot of pictures of, you know, the, the, the kids' birthday cakes, uh, which we've, we've I, I think I've shared, like the, pit, the elephant in all those days. You know, that was, that was the time. I mean, would you? Would somebody want to see this? Oh, hey, Lisa Eaton. Welcome. It's good to have you here. She said, didn't Debbie have lamps from Agnes Moorhead? We do. Good. We do have some lamps from Agnes Moorhead. Sharp. Moore. That's good. Are, do we have them? Are they, where are they? They're, uh, right, right now, those are in the living room uh, of her little sitting area. Yeah. By the way, here was one of the, you can go to the, here was another John Courtney. That was out. This was in front of the Western Town, by the way. This, this one here. Look up. Okay. So that was John Courtney and I in front of the Western Town. This, we're getting a little more sophisticated. Now this Western Town you built in the backyard? Yeah. So we're oh, my gosh. It looks... We're 14 years old. Well, the stuff came from MGM, a lot of it. Oh. But we're four, I'm 14, so things got a little more sophisticated at that point. Oh uh, we've had gosh. two years to make other films. But I was trying to find the early birthday uh, stuff because I do have some of that early birthday footage. I see a lot of pictures of you and I together here. I was t figuring that, you know what, we have been together for 12 and a half years. Isn't that weird? Time Why is that weird? Because time has just flown by. And Pictures another, like and, that, you mean? Well, in Pictures some like ways this? it feels like, yes, that was when we went to the Academy Awards in 2017. Yep. That's Carrie's house, yeah. And Here was one of those birthday parties. Oh, my gosh. That's Look me over that. there. Who is the person at the very end of the table? Ah, it's one of the mothers. I really don't know. I was trying, but and that. And Hedda Hopper used to come to those parties, right? Yes. Well, and I don't, you know, we'd have to, we could do a whole thing on. Birthday parties. On birthdays. Yeah. Here's the, more, here's more, elephant. here's more Western town stuff. Oh my gosh, that is so great. Look at, we're getting a ton of hearts. But I was, what I was looking for though was more like the. Oh, there's a picture. Now, I took that picture at a recording session. That's, that's Landis, Belushi, and Danny. Oh, wow. And Ray Charles. And, no uh, way. Where was this? In a recording studio. Wow. Is that your photo? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so John Landis is all the way on the right. Yeah, Landis. Belushi, Ackroyd, who's this? I see Ray Charles. Who's that? I'm not sure. That's probably Cropper, one of the guys that played on the band, you know, was a guitar player. Probably Cat Stevens, and you didn't even know it. I don't remember uh, what. I was always asking why, with your mom being Agnes Moorhead's executor, she didn't challenge the. She did challenge it. Oh, she did? She, there was a major lawsuit. Okay, so. Now, this is the Greenway swimming pool. Um, there were three levels to the pool. Had, there was three pools. There was an upper pool. A waterfall came down into this pool, and then there was a lower pool even beyond that. Wow. Um, so that, that was kind of a unique feature there. I am in front of the trains at uh, Traveltown. Remember Traveltown? Yep. Look at that. Oh, my God. There's part of the front of Greenway. It was really well landscaped. Had beautiful sort of very modern landscape. There's Yang and Mrs. Yang. Toffish, time to get a up for school. I love you, baby. 
Caddy fish, tiny giddy up for school. I love you. Aww. So that was uh, Yang. Obviously, and that's her. Now, notice how she has those little slippers on. Yeah. So you had this little shuffle, shuffle, shuffle sound effect. <laughs> uh oh, there's. So that was Vegas, obviously. What What was she singing there? I have no memory of such things. And, but there you are behind her playing guitar. I know, but I don't remember what we're doing. I'd uh, have to like look at the music or something. Latest style says I remember Travel Town. Absolutely. Now that is. I was in here though for something else. Uh, you were oh you were asking about the head of hopper stuff so that would have been look at Debbie. that's the screening room she looks so this is the head of hopper moment by the way so this would have been a head of hopper thing now I see there I am there that's uh now Danny Sackheim look him up he's the big director yeah he directed a lot of Game of Thrones yes and many many other amazing and and things. he was a little younger uh, but Danny says the only reason why I even got into business is because of those films you just saw us making in the street. We would bring Danny in on the I think the whole his thing. dad was David Sackheim, who was an agent, as I recall, right? He was. Look yeah. at that. There's a rare picture. Oh, Eddie. Oh, my gosh. Look at that. That's a pretty rare shot. Ah, but here's what I wanted. This. So this was kind of some of the elaborate. <laughs> of course you had an elephant at your birthday parties. Yeah, I mean, everybody does that, I'm sure. I'm there, going to give you. I'm going to give you a little bit of an elephant. There's my mother, and trivia. look at look at the, my expression. By the way, <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> okay, so how do you give an elephant a haircut? <laughs> oh no, he with needs a blowtorch. Oh, you burn his hair? Yeah, because that's look terrible. At, see how thick. The, that's it, terrible. Yeah, but they don't feel it. But that, so that's the, the amazing thing. Um, this is oh one of my, my early golfing God, pictures. A lot of people ask how long I've been golfing. And I like to show him this picture because I was starting to get the hang of it right about there. Oh, there's Stan Freeberg. Oh, yeah. I that, was that was that the, the last, last year, Christmas? just before he died. I remember this, yeah. Richard Landers, we were just talking about him. Oh, yeah. That's Carrie's house. <laughs> there's Yippie waiting for me. That was Carrie in the background, I <laughs> think. There's Yippie waiting. Oh, that, I miss him so much. He saw me drive away and didn't see me and come back. And would sit there for hours and wait for him to come back. Yeah. Okay, there's the Western Town from a different angle. Different day, different deal, different whole, different wardrobe too. That's Carrie and Harry right there, and there's more pictures of the pots and whatnot. Anyway, I don't have to bore you with all this. I, you know, or maybe Ron you like Hibbs all this. Ron says, "Todd, you know so many things about so many things. I would love to see you on Celebrity Jeopardy. Oh, huh. I would too. You know what? We should just watch that show one night, and I, you, you don't. Why would I do well on that show? Because you know so much about so many things. I see. Yes, and I would love to see how many of those you get because they're hard to get. I was too busy for stuff like that. Now, now look, here's, look Are at, you too here's, busy for that? Here's Las Vegas oh. uh, coming in for a landing at Las Vegas. Now, there's the dunes right there. This is Las Vegas Boulevard right here. That's the Sahara. There's Landmark. So this is the Desert Inn right here. Desert Inn Golf Course, the whole thing. That's the, the Sahara down there. So Sahara, Landmark, Desert Inn, nothing over here yet. Maybe the Silver Slipper could have been over here, possibly. Looks like Caesars is under construction. That's Caesars Palace. How about that? I mean, that's just a really early, early... I probably just snapped that picture like in, from a window as we're coming in because you're going to... That's right to the right of me is McCarran. And there's Nellis Airfield out there. Still Nellis Air Force, still out there. Uh, yeah, that was, I'm sorry to digress, but I just saw that. And I was like, wow, that's kind of a no, neat. No, that, that is cool. I mean, there's some really strange things in here. Here's my mother golfing. Who's she with? This is uh, from Susan Slept Here. Oh, yeah. So that's, is that? Dick Powell? Mm, that's not Dick Powell. That's his sidekick. Anyway, uh, so I also brought with me uh, something. Oh, I like this picture. I've never seen this one. You've never seen that? That's mm -hmm. a funny one. That was my birthday. Aww. That's so great. Uh, what I was going to say is I have a picture. I have some, uh, I have a show in here yes. that is kind of interesting. Uh, it is, and I, we could skip through it a little bit, but it, it was the Children of Stars shows. Do you remember that show? Did you ever see that show? Children of Stars? No. Okay, so, but I would like to see that now. 
I well, mean, I would love to here, make here, that. So here, here it is, and there we are. So, I mean, we could play the setup. I don't know how much this we can run, but we, we could play a little of it. <coughs> he has a little red light over there. Like Hello, Los Angeles. Okay. This is Australia talking. Hello. How are you going, Cobble? All right. True blue. Bloody beauty bottle. You can hear rustling noises. Uh, can you hear more than rustling noises? Do you like to run this down my jacket or no? Uh, my name is so Mike Ross. So it's a live I have a farm, and I'm in the losing business. And, uh, bloody lucky. So that's the sound check, so let's get to the show. There's the show. Story has uh, caught up with many of these when she decided to put a book together she's working on called Portraits of a Second Generation. And today I'm delighted to welcome in the studio in Los Angeles, Rory Flynn. And uh, that's Rory on the left-hand side, if I'm right. Is that you, Rory? That's me. Hi, welcome. And joining her is Todd Fisher. Next to Rory is Todd Fisher, the son of Debbie Reynolds and Eddie Fisher. And then on the right of the screen, we welcome Chris Costello, who's the daughter of Lou Costello. Let's hear a big Australian welcome to all three of them. Welcome indeed. Costello. Rory, um, this Lou idea for a book on the second generation, how did it all come about? Well, I'll tell you, Mike, I started doing this um, when I started getting very curious about what some of these kids look like, the ones who are not in the limelight, the ones right. who are uh, in other professions, usually. And uh, I thought I'd put together a photographic essay, just uh, find, telling what they're doing. Errol and Flynn's daughter. A pretty good picture of what they look like today. That's a great idea for a book. Now, of course, we know who Errol Flynn is. Uh, he was one of the greatest stars on the screen. There's no doubt about that. That's Dad. Uh, can you tell who Mum is and uh, which marriage Mum belong? Uh, which marriage you belong to? I am the second daughter of his second marriage to Nora Eddington. Right. And um, well, I have an older sister, Deirdre. And I have another brother, Sean, who is from his first marriage and from Lily Demita, and yes. I have another sister, Arnella, from his last marriage to Pat Wymore. Right. Now, Sean went missing in Vietnam during the, uh, the fighting over there. He was a soldier. Yes, he has been missing. I wear his uh, missing in action bracelet here. There's, there's a family, um, it's called the League of Families, in search of missing PO POWs still in Vietnam. There's apparently 2,500 American soldiers still missing over there and not accounted for, my brother being one of them. Mm. And uh, although he was non-combatant, he was a photojournalist. There's 22 photojournalists still missing since right. 1970. But you live in Hope? Well, I'm doing a lot of research on it now, Mike, and I've, um, I'm putting together a book on that, too, eventually. And that'll <coughs> have a lot of photographs in it. And uh, I think I'm hoping that I hear something yes. sometime. Yes, it's, it's the worst situation in the world. Rory, nice talking to you. I just want to uh, say hello to Todd. We'll be talking to all of you, of course. Todd, uh, nice to meet you. I've met your mother quite often on the show. She's a, a very popular and welcome uh, visitor to Australia. But um, your, your oh, parents, man. Eddie and uh, Debbie, separated when you were, uh, I think, before you were one year old. Is that right? Yeah, it was about uh, three months, basically, so right. I recall the situation very well, as you can imagine. Yeah, I was going to ask you a lot of in-depth questions about that final day. <laughs> Tell me... Uh, uh, I particularly, the four-month area is what I would really like to discuss. We might, that, that might be the subject of a special on its own in that case. Listen, yeah, uh, that could be good. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you were brought up by your stepfather, Carl, in that case, and uh, your sister, Carrie, who... Uh, was in Star Wars and all that type of thing. Um, yeah. That was the immediate family for you then. Oh yeah, we we're all very close. Uh, Carl, who just passed away that, uh, this year, right. actually would have been late 82, uh, but we were very close up to that point. I was one of the only people in the family to become friends with him again after the divorce. Uh -huh. But uh, my sister and I are very close, and we frequently hang out, so to speak, and uh, yeah. my mother and I are very close, and my real father, Eddie, and I are extremely close. Yes, that's a great story, and I'll ask you about that a little later on, but we'd just like to, to welcome well, Chris I'm Costello at this now, time. No. <laughs> <laughs> be patient, my boy, be patient. I'm glad you picked up on that, the audience there. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, um, uh, I'd just like to welcome you. Chris Costello, what's, um, what's your family situation? What's my family situation? How do you follow this, this act? Um, well, her and I, are, <laughs> we're starting our own family, actually. <laughs> right. <laughs> what well, we've got to stay here. This could my be family situation is, is real good. Um, Dad was Lou Costello. Dad, Dad, we got that sorted uh, out. 
I, I couldn't hear you. What? Dad, uh, Dad was Lou Costello, the the comedian. Correct. Right. Now he he was uh, he he was Italian. Yes. Uh, well, he was born in New Jersey, but his father came from Italy and was studying to be a priest. So interesting. And uh, you know, he came over to America and met my grandmother and uh, started to raise a family. So I would say my father was a first generation uh, American. Oh, right. <laughs> that, that was well done. Very well done. Australian, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, just on that, Chris, uh, what, uh, who else is in the family these days? Well, I have two older sisters, uh, Patty and Carol. Mm. A lot of relatives coming from an Italian family, of course. Uh -huh. And I'm real happy to say that my oldest nephew, nephew who was named after my father, is making me a great aunt in a month. <laughs> <laughs> hide the I'm child. I'm not ready for that at all. No, no, hide, hide the child. Don't admit to it at all. Uh, uh, when you went to school with your father, a very famous comedian, were you expected to be uh, funny by the other kids? Oh, I think at, at times, especially when I was in high school, I think people more or less treated me like Lou Costello. And God forbid if I should have a day where I just did not, you know, want to laugh or I was serious, you know, yeah. people would always think that you were angry. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, today, even if, if I perform, if I trip, you know, people will think it's a pratfall and will start laughing. So right. at times it's real hard to just carry on with your own identity of being, you know, Chris Costello. Yeah. When you were a kid, was your father a funny man at home? Would he try to cheer you up if you were sick or something like that? Oh, sure. But I mean, basically his nature at home was, was nothing, you know, as, as to the character he portrayed on the screen. In fact, he was very quiet. Uh, however, if one of us were ill, or if he spanked us or disciplined us and he felt guilty about it, then he might start tripping over his feet and running into the walls. But he ran a real tight ship at home, and there was just one captain himself. <laughs> right, right. Okay, Rory, I just wanted to ask about Errol as a father. He, uh, uh, what are your memories of your relationship with him? Well, my dad, I have really some wonderful memories of my father. I. I, I always thought that he was very special and he was very um, sort of filled with a personal grace. He was very much a gentleman, a perfect gentleman as a matter of fact. And uh, I remember him always opening doors for my mother and so forth. In fact, he gave her a party, a birthday party one time, and he filled the entire swimming pool with her favorite flower, gardenias. It was really wonderful. The whole house smelled for two days afterwards. It was great. Yeah. What about... But, um, I found that my, you know, a lot of people thought that possibly my dad wasted part of his life, and I don't, I don't agree with that. I found that he was... A very, he was a romantic. He was an adventurer. He, he traveled all over the world. He fathered four children. He, uh, he worked hard. He lived hard. He drank hard, and he loved hard. And I'm very proud to be his daughter. Sounds like Errol Flynn to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds mighty like him. Like hey, that <laughs> was the guy I knew in the movie. <laughs> what, uh, what, what about, uh, I mentioned yesterday when we were talking about this uh, se segment coming up on the show, that um, uh, parties in those days that were given for kids were quite incredibly lavish, with parents trying to top one another. What's some of the memories of parties that you have? Oh, Either gosh, yours or others? Yes, well, we had... Uh, my dad used to give a lot of great parties, and that was one of his favorite things to do. But um, one time, he, on my sister's second birthday, he brought her home a little pony that he hid in her bedroom. He tied it full of ribbons, and, and she was quite surprised. The, the pony ended up eating the birthday cake. But um, one of the, the nice things about it, that this shows how thoughtful my father was, he made sure that the pony that he got her was going to have a pony so that when I came along, which was in three months, I would also have a pony. No, Do you that's understand? That's boy, he was thinking of me before I was even born. So. That's cute. But I've, after doing this little um, essay on these kids, I've, I've found that all of them had parties. In fact, I was at some of them. Skylar Johnson, for one, had Judy Garland singing Over the Rainbow at her party, and she had Rin Tin Tin was doing tricks. <laughs> and... Um, Taryn Power, she used to, she grew up in Italy, but um, 
Well, who else was... Well, well I can tell you the good party, as long as... Can you? Because, roller because, skating rinks, you know, little on your, private On the ship skating. that your father made a film on, uh -huh. uh, I had a birthday party on. My mother rented, or didn't rent it, just borrowed lot one at MGM. Uh -huh. And I had a birthday party there, and we were swinging around on the, on the uh -huh. pirate ships and all the things yeah. that your father made films on, and my mother filmed it and made That's little great. movies of us, but that was lavish as they get. My mother was also the same way, would love to. Yeah. But, but, uh, but Todd, children. Uh, Todd, I must ask you about some of the lavish things that happened to you as a kid. Now, I believe Debbie decided that uh, every boy should have a, a tree in the backyard so he could have a cubby house. You didn't have oh, a yeah. tree in the backyard. Well, you want that story? Okay. Yeah, I love it, yeah. <laughs> well, basically, I decided I wanted a tree house, and... Uh, as all children should have a tree house, you know. But in this case, we didn't have a tree big enough to house a tree house. So my mother got together with some friends and they bought a hundred foot pine tree and had a crane build, you know, bring, they, it took them a week just to get the tree in the backyard. They yeah. brought it in on two semis in the middle of the night as if they were moving a house and they lowered it in with a big crane. And I had to wait six months for the tree to mature so I could build a tree house in there. <laughs> that must and, have been a uh, tough period. <laughs> It was fun. But, uh, you know, that's, that's realistic, you know. <laughs> sure, totally. Uh, tell everyone, I'd, 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 love you to describe the, I'd love you to describe, Todd, the, the house. Um, you had, uh, now, for kids, you had a back lot there. And uh, tell them about the theater and the house and everything else. All right. Well, we had a, a motion picture theater that was uh, 35 millimeter and 16, and whatever, basically whatever you wanted to run. And it was very nice because there was a very big couch in the back of the projection room that would hold, say, 10 or 12 people. And the other end of the room was all screen. Mm -hmm. So when you would run movies like Grand Prix and things like that, you know, you could get yourself ill <laughs> while the camera bounces up and down, you'd be getting dizzy and stuff. So that was great fun. And, uh, oh, we had uh, uh, a gymnasium and uh, saunas and three swimming pools. And we lived off of a golf course, so there was unlimited property to run on. Of course, the people who owned the golf course didn't appreciate it, but nonetheless, we had a great time on the golf course. <laughs> Is that and, true that uh, you... It, Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, is that true that you had a, uh, a Western set in the backyard, a cowboy movie set? Yeah, I uh, later on in life decided that uh, the house wasn't enough. And so I decided to build a Western town in the backyard. So I built about 250 foot of Western town. We got the sets from MGM, some of them, and moved them by truck to the yard. And then we built quite a few of them. And we made actual, not only sets, but legitimate rooms, and uh, a sheriff's office, and a bar and grill, and a post office, and a, a saloon, a two-story saloon with a hotel room, and it took me about a year and a half to finish it all off. Mm. And then we made the remake of Butch Cassidy, <laughs> and Sundance Kid, and Molly Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of loyalty there. Chris, what was, uh, what was well, birthday time like at your place? Well, I can remember that uh, our backyard was reminiscent of Your mics are off. Thank you, Ryan. This is a, a picture of uh, for me from that show. I was just showing, but I'm wearing a jacket. And I have here a No Devils logo on my shoulder because we had a, a segment in my show called The Demon Zone. Right. And it's a, that's a devil with a line through it. Dan Aykroyd was in that sequence playing Rod Serling, and that's where he got the idea for Ghostbusters. Because then they put the ghost with the line through. Oh, it. that's so cool! And so, and he was doing Rod Serling for, at my show. But that tells, you, and that is also when Cat and I first saw each other at the hiding place. They didn't hear that story because. Oh, okay. So this this picture you're looking at of Todd is 1980. This that segment like 82 was about 82, which is when I was going to the hiding place, the church that Todd and Henry started in Los Angeles and so that's exactly the time that I was like who is that that's Todd Fisher oh. and who is that <laughs> and no no he's they said it's Todd Fisher that's it's Debbie Reynolds son and Eddie Fisher's son and I said oh 
And they're like, you're married. I'm like, oh, I know, but I'm not dead for crying out loud. I can look, right? It was just, <laughs> I thought you were the cutest boy I had ever seen. What is it about that you think is so cute? Well, look at this You face. like those fat lips. That's I like the fat lips. <laughs> I, I call them pillowy lips. And um, I also, let me get over here. I, I also just um, thought that your uh, teeth were really cute. Yeah, I, I don't know what it was. It was a teeth thing. I, do, I remember that. And then also, um, I liked your size because you were very tiny. Well, you always went for those jumbo guys. No, so. I didn't. That wasn't my type. I love small guys. That's a good thing. But I, I always ended up because I don't think I'm going to grow any guys. I don't know why, you know. <laughs> I, but anyway, that's the truth. Those were all the little things. I just thought you were cute. Oh, and your your tail feathers were really cute. Is that a nice way of saying it? <laughs> you just had the best. If I can drop the BJ, you could certainly say ass or something. <laughs> Right. But anyway, I thought you looked really good in your bell-bottom jeans. Yeah, That's that would have been that era, right? Huh? You would have had... I never really got into that too much. That would have been earlier. What's that? I was into like 501s by that point. You know, you were wearing Landlubbers. What's a Landlubber? Landlubbers was the jeans that we wore in the 80s, in the early 80s. We all had Landlubber jeans. Does anybody remember Landlubber jeans? Is it just me? Well, if you say so. Well, let's see. I, I see hearts going up. So, yes, Todd was so cute, Seth says. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Debbie, Debbie Sanders Lewis, Todd, you are the perfect size. And Sherilyn Coviello says, just say he had a sweet ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, my God. Gina Glass, it's his onion, Catherine Hickland. <laughs> uh, Deb Tyler, oh, my. Oh, hey, Jamie Nye. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I got to tell you, pint size, Nikki Luongo. He's got Debbie's eyes, says Elizabeth Gandy. Uh, <laughs> Deb Tyler, I love that you had a crush on Todd from way back. I did. <laughs> Tracy Saunders, you, you're cute, Todd. Get over it. You still are. Uh, Gerilyn thought you looked like Bobby Sherman. And uh, some people say, Diane Vasquez says you had a Steven Tyler thing going on. The Steven Tyler lips. Um, so anyway, uh, that was really fun. I've never seen that show. And I love anything that has to do with Star's children because it's so interesting to me how they grow up and how they develop. And you how know, old did you say bizarre... she is now? You said that the so, Flynn... That... Uh, Errol Flynn's daughter, uh -huh. she's 77 now, I think, 77. Wow. Um, but it's a weird thing, because I looked her up, and there was another Rory, and they, they, they it was, it's very strange, but it, it's very interesting. Um, so she was born in 1947, and on March 12th, 1947, so she, would be I'm trying to find a like a like a Wikipedia on her because that then there's this other weird thing that said that Rory Flynn was shot in Philadelphia <laughs> with several bullets and I, and I don't I don't really understand if it's the same person or you know I'm not really sure I'm sure there's more than one Rory Flynn R R Rory Flynn yeah but she was beautiful I mean that she was a model and an actor actually she became a model and an actor so there you go well that was fun I love this show and tell this is a really fun one shall we give stuff away well, I wanted Ryan also to let people know we haven't do, we're not doing an auction because uh, Ryan and I there's actually there's Ryan you can tell there's him right Ryan. there. Ryan and I actually uh, located a bunch of stuff when he was here, uh, and mm -hmm. rather than uh, put it up at each show, uh, he's gonna I'll let him explain what he's gonna do. So go there you are, Ryan. Go for it. Do you want me to show a couple of examples? You could. Just tell them what's going up or what your plans are, because I don't want people to think we're, you know, you know, not putting things up. Uh, no, we're, we're going to make it a little take, more I can accessible. Show you two things I've got here. Uh, we found a whole. Well, I, I didn't find anything. Todd found it all. Uh, he found some really cool vintage 
posters, and this particular one is, um, well, Todd, you can explain well, what it is. Well, it's Bachelor, but it's Spanish. In fact, I think mm -hmm. what we found was a stack of Spanish posters, and it's an unusual side. You see how they're 14 by 21, but they're still like mini posters. And yep. so... And then here's, um, let me get you, you the... You would have uh, had a whole bunch of those, right? Like a, a set of... Oh, yeah. What? That's Tammy again. Well, that's Singing in the uh, Rain there. That's, that's Singing in the Rain right yeah. there. Yeah, now, so that's a Spanish singing in the rain. 17 by 13 is the size on that. That's which nice. is a very mm -hmm. unusual size. But what's good about it, it's very displayable. And, of course, that's my mm -hmm. mother in the All I Do is Dream of You outfit throwing the pie in Gene Hagen's face. And uh, on the left is Sid Charisse with her amazing legs. And, anyway, it's kind of a, I, I think this is just a unique piece of artwork. Uh, so what are you doing? You're going to do those separately? So we will put, and, and there are so many more than just those two. I just had those two on my computer, but uh, they are easily accessible to you there so that you can ship them. But we'll start putting those up on the Debbie Reynolds Studio Store page, and we'll put those up as auctions. And uh, you can take a look at them and put a bid in, and you know, hopefully you will walk away with it. But there are some really cool pieces coming up. We, some are signed. That's right. So what happened is Ryan was upstairs... Uh, looking through things, getting ready for some auctions items. And I had a few minutes, so I started digging through this one drawer and I unearthed a lot of stuff. I mean, there's a pretty good pile of stuff. And, and, uh, a lot, and some of it, you know, was stuff that I, I'm going to keep, but I had a lot of stuff in there that we had either duplicates of and we could afford to share. So there's, there's a significant uh, cachet of, of Debbie stuff coming your way. <laughs> That's a good oh, way to probably put it. at least two dozen things that I have photos of on my on my phone. Okay, well, I'm, uh, they'll be watching for that. So I just didn't want people to think we had forgotten about the live auction thing. Nope. Uh, uh, but it is also there's something also good about leaving it up on the website. It gives people a little more time to absorb it. Also, then Frank doesn't commandeer everything. No. <laughs> I have not seen Frank Poor in this room Frank. tonight. Where I've been texting he? Frank. I don't know if he's in the chat room or not, but uh, we've been chatting during the show oh. here, so I know he's around. Oh, good. Um, all right, so Jaren, Geraldine Coviello asked, what was the first thing that I checked out on you? You know, like, I guess that oh, I was Oh, we're still on my to. ass? No, it wasn't your ass, actually. It was <laughs> on the exact opposite of the spectrum. My shoes? No, it might have been. I, I honestly think that it was your hair and your teeth. There was my just, hair. Yes, your I had hair a helmet and on. your teeth. <laughs> and, and and I remember, I don't know. And but the thing that I loved the most about you back then was how much you loved the Lord, and that just really got me because I was married to self-centered narcissist. <laughs> well, That'll we'll do just it. Leave it at that. <laughs> I'm the extra, I'm definitely the opposite of that. Yeah. So so it well was, when you grow up with a narcissist yeah. as a father. Which you did. Which I did. So yes. you get a pretty good idea of that's not a good thing. And my mother, what was cool about her, you know, where she was in a business and certainly at a stature in her career where she could have been a narcissist and gotten away with it, could have been a, a diva, princess, you know, whatever. She didn't choose that. She always chose the really approachable uh, person, uh, just one of us, uh, is how you you define her, very approachable and very normal. Uh, and and Carrie and I both had to see that, and it, that would have had a large influence on us. And also, obviously, she was a spiritual person, and without forcing it, it was down our throats. My mother was was a Christian and had a very strong sense of Christian values, community, country. You know, watching my mother tell her stories and entertaining the troops and the things that she did for the country uh, and for the community at large, starting hospitals and the City of Hope and all the charity things. You know, those, that's the trifecta of a quality person, you know, and, and the furthest thing from a narcissist. So growing up with that kind of a person allows you to uh, watch the narcissist and what he's getting out of life. And then you look at what my mother was doing, and it was pretty easy to realize that, that her lifestyle was a far more rewarding lifestyle yeah. than his. I wonder if they still do US to, USO tours for entertainers 
overseas. I'm not the, sure what their program is, but it's nothing like it was, I can guarantee you, because you don't have the likes of Bob Hope and Bing Crosby and my mother. And My mother was a small change item in the whole thing compared to Bob Hope. Bob Hope was the man. Yeah. Bob Hope was managing an entertainment tour that was constantly going out and entertaining our troops. And he would call up on the phone to people like my mom and other people and say, hey, you've got to come out with me. You know, and, and he had that sort of sway, like my mother, where you could not say no to Bob Hope yeah. and to your country. But it I, was, I, I think that it would be nice if they still did that for our troops. Well, they should. I just don't know who's managing such things. Also, when you have narcissists in Washington that are worse than the people in Hollywood running <laughs> television series of their own, They're it's hard there. to compete. Yeah. You know, I mean, how do you, these people are not like, you know, the people of then. No, that's uh, true. It's a different brand of, of entertainer and it's a, certainly a different brand of government. Yes, I, I agree. Also, I mean, there's not a lot of people sing you know not a lot of actors sing but it's not just singing you had what you had the qualification for going out was you had to have a little self-contained act but it, you couldn't go with your all your stuff you yeah. can't have a freaking touring rig so you had to have you had to be able to sort of ad lib and entertainment entertain with the most minimum setup i mean yeah. you saw the stuff that we did a few months back of my mom in korea I mean, they have Jeeps with their headlights facing the stage and 50,000 guys watching the show and there's no spotlights, really a very minimal PA system. So you, you've got to be able to ad-lib, you've got to be able to in entertain. My mother was the quintessential ad-libber, the quintessential entertainer from the standpoint of she could work with anybody and just springboard into any sort of shtick, any sort of comedy, any sort of song sing harmony, sing solo, just jump in anywhere. You know, it's, it's a, mm, people, da entertainers were different than back then because so many people, if you don't give them a script, they don't feel comfortable. Uh, you know, actors Well, that today definitely would, would not be the right crew you know, for that. Right, right, right. But I, I wish but that no there were. But no actors were, were going to do it. that meant to the men overseas? I mean, like, can you imagine? Oh, I know them. I, know, I don't have to imagine because I have had thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, of them come up to me, hand me photographs, hug me, tell me how much it meant to them. I mean, it's not just, uh, I'm not speculating. I have met them. Uh, and we had the hotel in particular. We used to do a Veterans Day event where we opened the showroom up for veterans for free. And we had a huge veterans pair of veteran shows back to back. My mother would come out on the stage, you know, with the Jeep and the machine gun. And we ran the clips and we talked about Korea and she sang all the George M. Cohen tunes. And it was very patriotic stuff and did a regular show. But the stories that they had, you know, of what it meant to them at that time for somebody to come to them and go out of their way or when they didn't have to, they could stay home and make money. I mean, you know. No, but I, I just wish that this was still in place today because. Maybe there is something. Maybe somebody in our well, audience I, knows. I've, I've done it, but not overseas. I went, I've gone and performed at base camps, army camps. Sure. And here Tra in the US. Training camps. When they're, when they're, uh, when new, um, when there's a change in deployment, when some people are coming home and they're deploying new ones. So I've done that. Well, I mean, that's okay. Um, I mean, that's certainly one way to do it. The, the difference was in World War II and in Korea and in Vietnam, you know, you were in theater and there was nobody coming back for, you know, a year at a time, you know, and, and you'd stuck over there having no sense of, of America and family and no sense of, of home. And so when these entertainers came there and sang their songs and danced their dances, it brought home to the field to the theater, to the encampments, you know, where they were, a lot of them, you, you saw those pictures by mom, they're in the middle of nowhere. And Vietnam was no difference. I mean, they had many, many base camps in Vietnam, extremely remote, no way in except helicopter. Oh, listen, I love this. I love, love, love this. Sharon Amorosa, whose husband fought in the Vietnam War, and he just passed away three or four weeks ago. And Joe, he was a musician. Um, she said they should bring entertainment into the VA hospitals. Some vets don't get any visitors. All right. 
Yes, Sharon. Yes. I, I used to be in a group in New York called Hearts and Voices, and we would go to the AIDS wards in the hospitals in New York City, and we, they would give us an empty hotel room, I mean hotel room, an uh, empty hospital room, and then we would put a piano in there, and uh, there were different Broadway performers who would donate their time, and and we would go visit a hospital, usually by ourselves, and we would sing for the people who wanted to be entertained. And so why, why couldn't we do that? I think that is such an awesome idea. Well, there's a whole... Awesome in, in idea. Los Angeles, you know, there's a huge hospital there in Westwood. There is, the but we have but that, one here. We, we do, but they're, they're everywhere. So you need to find the ones that, has the, that have the live-in uh, patients that are not able to get out. Yeah. Uh, you know what, Sharon? Thank you for bringing that up. I'm going to look into that because that's doable. You but know? there are entertainers, I will say today, that are involved in things like this. So there's Operation Mend, Operation, uh, the, 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 the different charitable ones that the Thalians are still involved with. And speaking of the Thalians, Rudolidis just contacted me recently. Yes. And they're opening a thing in, on Hollywood Boulevard for the Thalians to help, like a little mini museum and a little place to raise money for the Thalians to help run, raise money for Operation Mend, which is now what the Thalians uh, are, the discipline that they're focusing on, um, which is all about the veterans, in particular the ones that are, that are mentally wounded. And um, so that's, uh, that's something we're going to be helping with. Oh, wow. Now, well, I I'm love just mentioning this. That. What's going to go in it? Well, I don't know. We're going to loan them some things that, that would be on display. They wanted some posters to, like, decorate the wall, like big posters. And what, is it near, like, the I think it's going to be near the Theater? Max Factor Museum and all that, right there on Oh, Bond. yeah, on Highland. Yeah. And, uh, yes, that would be great. But I think, I think the message, though, is that people like Mark, Mark Wahlberg, there are entertainers, you know, that spend a considerable amount of time uh, raising money to build those homes for the handicapped you veterans. You know what? He's tunneled to towers. He is, he is such a good person. Such a good person. I was absolutely blown away. But now when you think about it, that's what yeah. he can do. See, he's not a singer tap dancer. So yes, he's he not, is. A oh, singer. he is a singer. Yeah. I didn't know that. But I don't see him doing that. But I bet he would is the point. That, so anybody, if you could. It was Marky Mark. Marky Mark. Yeah. His brother, it, what's his brother's name, Jordan? You are the pop culture king. Um, Donnie, Donnie Wahlberg, who was in New Kids on the Block. New Kids on the Block. And then Marky Mark, was he a solo artist, Mark yeah, Wahlberg? He had a group called Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. So he Marky could sing? Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, yeah. yeah. yeah mm -hmm. like sing and dance. And mm -hmm. Well, so there you have But I'm just, So he's a perfect candidate because he's already into it. Yeah. You know, he and you know what I love it. about him? He made this movie, Father Stew. Remember, we watched it a few weeks ago. And, he, and it, it's a true story of a man who grew up you know, it, just being a bad boy and then ended up becoming uh, Father Stu. He became a minister or a priest, I guess, you know. And, and so uh, he said he made that movie and he had to pay for it himself because nobody was interested in making this movie. Of course not. And so he made this movie himself and he said he had to make it. He was led to make it because he himself is feeling a calling. Well, he himself is feeling like... His spirituality is it's needs a part of who he is to be more explored, and that it's such a part of him. And, and Mel so Gibson he made that is movie no different. On his own. Mel Gibson is plays his father in that movie. I know, but Mel Gibson also is no different. When he did Passion of the Christ, nobody wanted to make the movie. He raised the money independently and had to go to England to a guy that I know in England who helped him raise the money. The Catholics put up the money for the movie. Oh, wow. So uh, very hard, you know, sometimes, you know, Hollywood is, um, is moved by what's happening at the moment. They don't go out of their way to, you know, they're going to do what everybody else is doing for generally speaking. There are exceptions of producers, independent producers, of course, but the studio system usually is following what everybody else is doing and making Spider-Man 12, you know, uh, and that's, that's okay. I mean, there's a market for that, but what about all the other stories? you know, that need to be told. Yeah, so. think about all the scripts that live in the world by seasoned writers, new writers, just all unmade, you know, and just think about that, all undone. There's, uh, there, is, there are a million untold stories, some of which 
<clears throat> are too expensive, possibly. Right. You know, that's the challenge is to write a script, tell a story that's not too expensive to make. Well, I mean, but if the story is the story. Well, if it's character driven, then you don't have to worry about blowing well, things Well, but, but up that and is true and not true. Like, money. Well, I'll give you, to me, the great character driven story of my favorite character driven story of all time is Sergeant York, of which Gary Cooper wins best actor for. And, and you know, Gary Cooper is a, um, you know, plays Alvin York, the World War I uh, Medal of Honor winner. It's, an, it's one of the greatest movies ever, and it's also one of the greatest stories ever told about a conscientious objector going to war, very much like the remake that happened recently. Uh, saving, what was the one where they, the, the kids, the, par, the medic recently? Uh, not Saving Private Ryan, but not, it was at, way after that, the more recent one. Anyway, point is, this movie is based on an absolutely true story, and, and Alvin York, the real Alvin York, was the consultant on the movie, and the movie got made very accurately, and it's, a, it's totally, the whole movie is his life story, and there's a million life stories that are fascinating like this, yeah. you know, that can be told, and, and uh, that wasn't a cheap movie, but there are, there are stories that are just as interesting uh, and that are compelling and, and help people. Well, I, hey, Sean Dam, Hi, it's good to see you. He was my fantastic sound man. Uh, in Fresno, and he did the sound for the big show we did there um, at the Fox Theater. Good to see you, Sean. Good to see you here. All right, so I think it's time to give stuff away and let people go and enjoy their Sunday, and then and I'm going to pack because I'm leaving. You have I'm a closing leaving. video, too. I have a, I have a closing video of a... Of a I, I'm not sure what it is because Ryan picked it, but it's a hypnosis video. And uh, so I will be opening this Thursday night, uh, the 21st of July, at the Delaware State Fair. I will be performing two shows a night um, at 6 and... What time? Brian, do you remember what six time? 6 and 8. 6 and 8. Yeah, 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock. So if you are anywhere near Delaware, come be a kid again and come to the Delaware State Fair and come see and... I'll read your mind you and have hypnotize family there, right? you. I have family there. I'm really excited. All my long lost cousins that I discovered uh, over a decade ago when I started performing there. And uh, so I'm real happy about that. But if come see me and come get a hug and a, and, um, a smile and some love and laugh because it's going to be really fun. We're so going to get Joe Biden to come over and get hypnotized. He, you know what? We're staying in Rehoboth. You're right near him, right? I'm hoping not. But, but you could run, you get some ice cream with Joe. <laughs> I have questions I'd like to ask him. No, no. Oh, I have questions. No questions. Yes. Just roll with it. <laughs> Just roll with it. He'd make a great candidate I up do, on that though. Stage. I have questions that I would I'd like to ask. I'd love to see him up on that stage. <laughs> you, me too. <laughs> well, actually, I see him on the stage all the time. Oh, he does similar things on his own, actually. So now that I think about it. Yeah. Well, anyway. You, haven't, you know, that might be a good routine for you. What? Imaginary people. Imaginary people. You know, you've never done that. You no. Know, and, and you know how you... Uh, no, but I do the invisible hypnotist, which is sort of the opposite of imaginary people where they can't see me anymore. And ah, I that's good. Them on the stage. But I love the idea of this, uh, like shaking hands with imaginary people. I mean, that actually is very apropos. Yes. Well, there you have it. So anyway, if you're around, please come and say hi. Uh, let's give stuff away. Okay, so here's how it's going to go. We have the first wiener already. Um, because Ryan is in charge of the I randomizer. Said, I almost said Terminator. <laughs> the <tired>. randomizer. <laughs> the randomizer. And the winner okay. is. And the winner is Medea Smith Garvin. You are the first wiener. You have won a twenty-five dollar <laughs> gift certificate, and that's what we are giving away right now. And the num so Medea Smith Garvin, you have won a twenty-five dollar gift certificate by Cat Cosmetics, and we we are so happy for you. Uh, the second winner of the $25 gift certificate is Debbie Augustine. Her name just popped up on my screen. Thank you, Aspen. We get, the, we get uh, applause for them. Number three is coming up now. I see all the names in the circle. And then it has chosen Jamie Nye. You have won a $25 gift certificate. And congratulations now, Are you going to do, do one of these as the book? Yes, of course. And then, um, let's see here, Peggy Delgadillo, you are a wiener, and you have won a $25 gift certificate as well to catcosmetics.com, catcosmetics.com, that's my company, and get yourself something nice. 
Patricia Duff. You are the wiener of a $25 gift certificate. This is really weird because, you know, because the randomizer is picking, but like so far, three or four of these people have been to get your fire back, Jamie. Nye was in Pennsylvania. Debbie's, oh, here's a new name, Alice Harnish. Maybe she should get the book. Yes, she's going, you are new, Alice. And before we go on, let me just say, Alice, since you are new, I am going to um, tell you what you have won. You have won a copy of My Girls, which is a Todd book. Todd wrote this book about his mom and his sister, Debbie Reynolds and Carrie Fisher, and himself. It's an amazing book, and here. I will show it to you before the day is done because we don't have it on set. But congratulations, and all of you so far that I have uh, named, please write me at info at catcosmetics.com and claim your prize and give me your address, please. I'm going to need that. Uh, this is the book, Alice. It is uh, fantastic. It's got tons of pictures. Well, some of the stories that we've been talking about yeah, today. Yeah, tons of pictures, all really good, great pictures in here, great stories, and uh, he will be happy to sign it for you or whoever you would like it signed to. All right, we have... Uh, another wiener. Here we go. Kathy Gans, you have won. You have won a $25 gift certificate. And make sure that you claim it, and I will get that to you. Uh, and Angela Basir, that's what I always say, Angela Basir. Angela, you have won also a $25 gift certificate. So you just have to write me at info at catcosmetics.com, as everybody does, to claim your prize. Make sure I have your email That's eight. address. That's eight. We are done. Everybody, we have a closing video for you to all say goodbye to each other with. And um, it's a hypnosis. It's from my hypnosis show. So if you are curious about what goes on on a stage when people are hypnotized, here is one example of what it could be. And that's only because I don't like to humiliate people too badly. I, I do... <laughs> I do funny things, but I always bear in mind everyone gets to keep their clothes on, which is really nice of me. <laughs> there we go. So we're going to play that. Oh, we love you so much. Thank you for coming to be with us on this Sunday. And we just had a great night last night. We went to bed early. We, we feel really good today. It's good to share it with you this beautiful day. All right, so we're going to play this now. Good night, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. And enjoy this Thank clip. you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Thank you, Aspen. And, and say goodbye to Jordan, everybody, because he's leaving tomorrow. All right. Here we go. Off you go. Good. All right. You know what? Your shoe is ringing. You are the spy. Are you ready? 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 It's your mom. I'm inspired now. I've got to do some business. What'd she want? She asked me what I was doing. What'd she say when you told her you were busy because you're a spy? She said I'm on something. On <laughs> something. That's a good way of putting it. You're on something. Right? Oh, wait a minute. You have completely forgotten how to put on your shoe. You no longer remember how to put your shoe on or tie it. You're doing great. <laughs> By the way, I did. I meant to ask you, what's your name?
gross. Oh, what on earth? Are you kidding me? Who did that? You just took me. Huh? Nasty. He was so nasty. He was right Did you? Did I? Listen, I'm the light. You're gonna give it. You're gonna throw her under the bus. You were right there. Gross. Hallie, did you do it? I can't make no, no girl. I. Did you feel the earth move? It was just, oh, it's really vomit. Oh. Wordle, wordle, wordle. Oh, jeez. Oh. Oh, I'll tell you what. I didn't think supermodels did this sort of thing. I don't want to say anything, but I, I, I always thought there was just a little, I don't know, something. So this next person, oh my gosh. I'll tell you now, she, she performed at the Super Bowl like four years ago, and I thought, I, if, that, if that was a man, I'd marry her. I mean, really seriously, she's the hottest thing ever. Give it up for the one and only Beyonce! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Mr. Michael Jackson! <laughs> <laughs>